I just want to encourage you all, to, for those of you, we have some seats up here, for those of you who would like to sit during the program, we're going to get started here in about one minute. But I just want to welcome you all for coming this evening, and thank you. Thank you for supporting the Firefly Fund. Again, we have some seats up front. We encourage you to come down, come up front and sit down. And now, I'd like to introduce Ann Wyatt Little. Hi, good evening. How is everybody doing tonight? I want to welcome you all to the Firefly Fund's inaugural event, all of our guests here in Austin and those who have traveled to be here with us. I'm Ann Wyatt Little an anchor over at Fox 7 for Good Day Austin, and I'll be your MC tonight. I had the privilege of meeting Pam and Chris Andrews back in the fall of 2016. I met them at a fundraiser for Belle and Abby and was immediately touched by their story, which they let me share with Austin, and I've kept in close touch with the Andrews family since our first meeting and just continue to be amazed and inspired by their strength. I am thrilled to be here to help celebrate this historic night, celebrating the launch of the Firefly Fund. I want to welcome Mayor Steve Adler to the stage. Mayor Adler has been serving Austin since 2015 and has shown incredible dedication to making Austin a safer city for us all. In 2016, he was recognized for his innovative ideas and leadership by being elected to the United States Conference of Mayors Advisory Board. Everybody give Mayor Adler a warm welcome. So I think I get sandwiched in here today between two uh, uh, TV uh, uh, anchor, anchor people. Uh, first with, uh, with Ann, who used to cover me at City Hall, and then she got kicked upstairs. And, uh, but there was always, in the work that she does and in the questions she asks, such a you, apparent you know, a love for this city and a concern. I appreciate that. And with, uh, with Mr. Rather, I, I go back uh, real far, actually. My, my father was a film editor for CBS uh, in Washington, D.C., and I grew up on the Washington, D.C., CBS newsroom floor. I used to watch when Walter Cronkite would come down and tape live. Uh, and in fact, uh, when, when my uh, iguanas got too big and started becoming threatening, my mother thought, we, uh, we gave them to Mr. Rather and his son, I think. Uh, but I also want to want to thank everybody uh, for being here uh, tonight, and I I especially want to thank the the doctors and the scientists uh, who have traveled here to to be with us, uh, and who are involved in the in the treatment and seeking a cure for children uh, with very rare uh, neurodegenerative diseases. You know, Austin is a, is a wonderful and magical city, and I am real proud to be, to, to, to be its mayor. Uh, here you'll find not only great uh, music and food, uh, but you'll also discover our, our beautiful blue bonnets that are just beginning now to, to, to bloom. What you will also discover visiting us here is that we take care of our own, that we, we rally around those in need and we come together as a village, as a community, uh, as we have done with Andrew's children. Today is uh, World Rare Disease Day, uh, and I want to formally recognize this day uh, and um, uh, in the celebration of the Firefly Fund, the Firefly the Firefly Fund, <laughs> founded by uh, Pam and, and Chris Andrews. 
the, uh, the Andrews created the Firefly Fund uh, after their two daughters, uh, Belle, who's almost seven, and Abby, almost three, uh, were diagnosed with uh, Neiman Park type C1 uh, about a year ago in March of uh, 2016. Uh, Pam and Chris, uh, are you here? Are you back? Are they back there? They'll be coming out later. Then I won't introduce them now. Uh, but oh, here you are. Let's let's. Uh, uh, You guys have done such a, a wonderful job in creating this, uh, this, this fund uh, to help those like yourselves with children uh, who are facing uh, these kinds of uh, challenges. Uh, please know how much uh, your, your community is indebted and appreciative for the, for the action that you have taken. So thank you very much. I also want to, to recognize uh, that through Pam and Chris's uh, efforts uh, and the village they have created with the Dell Children's Medical Center, uh, the Seton Healthcare Family, uh, part of Ascension Health, uh, and the new uh, UT uh, Dell Seton Medical School, uh, they are all going to work together uh, to treat and seek a cure for neurodegenerative diseases in children. I also want to recognize uh, the efforts of the Firefly Board, uh, and I think that some of them are here with us uh, tonight. Uh, is uh, Marianne Dwight here? Would you stand up or raise your hand so people can see you in the way in the back? Thank you. And also, uh, Jack uh, Gullihorn. Is Jack here? I guess everybody's in the back. Mary Ben Ramsey. Hey, Mary Ben, thank you. And Dr. Amy White. Okay, thank you. So Austin is um, uh, joining with uh, Andrew's uh, village and community, uh, and now I get to read the, uh, the proclamation uh, that I signed today on behalf of the city of Austin uh, for the Andrew's uh, family. And I was told that it would be up here, and I don't, ah, and here it is. <laughs> I told you it was a magical city. <laughs> Here is the proclamation. Be it known, whereas, that February 28th, 2017 is the 10th anniversary of the cel celebration of the World Rare Disease Day, which is celebrated around the world on the last day of February every year to raise awareness of rare diseases. Austin is proud to join in this celebration and to recognize the efforts and contributions of Pam and Chris Andrews and their daughters, Belle and Abby, in raising Austin's awareness of rare diseases. And whereas the Andrews are joined in their fight by Dell Children's Medical Center, Seton Healthcare Family, part of Ascension Health, UT Dell Seton Medical School, they're going to work hand in hand with the foundation to tackle these neurodegenerative diseases in children with the ultimate goal of finding a cure for these diseases, uh, for NP NPC1 uh, and other rare diseases. And whereas Austin comes together to recognize the efforts of the Andrews family and the, and the Austin medical community in this gigantic task, joined by doctors and scientists and friends from across the country. Now therefore I, Steve Adler, mayor of the city of Austin, Texas, do hereby proclaim the last day of every February today and hereafter in Austin, Texas as World Rare Disease Day. Thank you, Mayor Adler, for your commitment to our city and the proclamation. 
Now we have a little surprise for you. Since April of last year, the Anders family has been working with journalists at People Magazine on a story about their journey with NPC One. Their story is featured in this week's People Magazine, which hits shelves this week. You may have seen some copies around the room. Along with an online release of a 30-minute documentary, we have a preview of that to show you tonight, and we hope that you'll take a copy of the magazine home. Here's that video. When you see these parents and this family taking on this incredible emotional challenge, it's actually a story of hope and inspiration. And the minute we saw their determination and their dedication, we knew this was a story we had to share. Hi, baby. In March of 2016, Pam and Chris Andrews received heartbreaking news. Their six-year-old daughter, Belle, was diagnosed with a fatal genetic disease called neiman pick type C1. It's never easy to give uh, news of a disease diagnosis that's going to change a family, sometimes just totally turn them upside down. You like that one, too? Yeah. <laughs> he said most children live to be between the ages of 12 and 20. He said, um, typically most children die within 10 years after diagnosis. Not only were we going to lose her, we were going to lose her in the most brutal and awful way possible. <laughs> it's an extremely rare disorder. This is a disorder that occurs in well less than one in a hundred thousand births. So it's pretty unlikely. Chris and I had both inherited an autosomal recessive gene, and Belle had inherited both autosomal recessive genes from both of us. She had a 25% chance of inheriting both of those recessive genes. So instead of getting my husband's beautiful blue eyes, she got both of our recessive genes for NPC1. As they were trying to process this information, they realized that since this was a genetic condition, their other daughter, Abby, could have the same disease. He said at the end of the meeting, we need to test Abby right away. She wasn't showing any symptoms. At that time, she didn't have a swollen spleen. We were holding out hope, and really the doctor was holding out hope. He was like, she only has 25% chance of also having it. He called, and I answered, and I said, do you have the results for Abby? He said, yes, I do, and I said, I said, does she have it? And he said, yes, she does. There was something out there. There was somebody out there working on this. Um, and that, that gave me a lot of hope. There's a promising new treatment that is currently in trials. And it does have a fairly dramatic effect in terms of prolonging life and reversing symptoms in animal models. We're now studying it in people. Oh, over there. We have two patients who've been in treatment for finger. almost three years and one who's been in treatment for about two and a half years. And those three patients have not shown any progression in their disease for that period of time. Chris and I made the decision, let's get the medicine in the girls right away. You're looking pretty good, I think. I, 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 we are like very happy. Yay! Okay. <laughs> All right, that's good. What I can tell you with Abby, Ever since she's started on VTS 270, she's taken off like a rocket. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, sometimes you just have to she is talking a lot in two languages. She started school. She's running. She's climbing couches. She's jumping on the bed. It's amazing what Chris and Pam were able to do for their children in such a short amount of time. But they knew that finding an actual cure for this disease would take a much larger effort. The VTS 270, as my husband says, is not a cure. Gene therapy is what we have, is really what we need to do in order to cure this disease. We said, we're going to create a foundation. We are going to fund research. We didn't know who, how, or when. Who, to how, do or it. when. We didn't know the details. The Andrews named their foundation the Firefly Fund, and they've already begun raising money. The early data that was coming back from the VTS 270 was really promising. It was remarkable. And I started to feel myself coming out of a place of despair. 
and I started realizing that we weren't starting at ground zero. This is a situation where we might be changing the disease. Okay. All right, smile. And for a child neurologist that has had to do that kind of talking with families all these years, this is very exciting. I believe with every fiber in my body that my girls are going to live and they are going to be happy. That was pretty incredible and just a taste of the full version, which I watched earlier today, and I encourage each of you to go and do. Now I'm honored and humbled to introduce world-renowned journalist Dan Rather. Dan began his career in journalism in 1950 with the Associated Press. He worked his way up the ladder, covering notable events like President Kennedy's assassination and the Watergate scandal, eventually becoming the anchor of CBS Evening News for 24 years. Dan and his wife, Jean, are fellow Austinites, and the Andrews family is grateful to count Dan and Jean among their many supporters. Please welcome Dan Rather to the stage. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Ann Wyatt, for that uh, overly generous introduction. I'm honored and privileged to be here tonight and to celebrate the inauguration of the Firefly Fund. If you can indulge me just a moment, I'd like to introduce my wife of 60 years, fighting heart, Jeannie Grace Goble from Winchester, Texas. <laughs> As I think most, if not all of you know, this inaugural is about an Austin family that learned almost a year ago that their two children had a debilitating disease. And what determination, grit, perseverance, a dream, and a community can do when all are aligned. When my wife, Jean, and I learned about Pam and Chris Andrews' girls from our friend and their grandmother, Barry Crowley, we of course wanted to help. I've always been drawn to stories of overwhelming adversity and finding hope in the face of such adversity. I know from my own life experiences that when adversity strikes, one doesn't run, but faces life head on. And I believe it's because of the village our beloved Austin, coming together to assist and support our neighbors, the Andrews, that there is now hope for the Andrews and others similarly situated. Today, the Andrews and all of us here tonight do have hope for patients and the families of patients with NPC1. There's no one more fearless are determined than parents on a mission to save their children. Within a month of the diagnosis of the two daughters, Pam and Chris had their daughters enrolled in a clinical trial for a drug that shows the progression of this insidious disease. This trial was conducted at the Rush Medical Center in Chicago. This trial was overseen by the National Institutes of Health where the Andrews also went in Bethesda, Maryland for observation. For 10 months, this family, the Andrews, went to Chicago every other week for treatments. Through their efforts and perseverance, the Austin medical community stepped in. Now Dell Children's Medical Center and the Seton Healthcare family of, uh, of health working with the National Institutes of Health and a team of dedicated Austin doctors. A clinical trial site has been established in Austin, helping not only the Andrews daughters, but other families who live in Texas and the surrounding region. This change alone has given the Andrews a great deal of hope. The Andrews no longer have to take their two young girls to Chicago every two weeks because Austin has responded. They now go to Dell Children's Medical Center, just up the road. As we say, they are now going local. And Seton Family of Hospitals and Dell Children's Medical Center 
are partners with the Firefly Fund in fighting NPC1. Austin responding to its own, neighbors helping neighbors. Now, as if moving the clinical trial site to Austin were not sufficient, the Andrews also forged ahead and engaged the UT Dell Medical School in their fight, and now UT Dell Medical School is a partner with the Andrews and the Firefly Fund in medical research and finding a cure for rare neurodegenerative diseases in children. Again, Austin responds to help its own. Now, speaking of the Firefly Fund, it's no surprise to anyone here that the Andrews were not content merely to get the local medical help for their daughters. Determined to spark interest and lead the way to a cure, the Firefly Fund, inspired by Bell and Abby's diagnosis, has as its core mission seeking and finding a cure for Bell and Abby's disease. And that, of course, will help children who are affected by genetic neurodegenerative diseases everywhere. Again, this village, our town, and this community are stepping up. And it's true, I'm an optimist by nature and by experience. But given that, I'm very optimistic that through these efforts, a cure will be found. Finally, <laughs> back. Finally, I want to underscore that the folks affected by this disease are not confined to Austin or Texas. They're found all over the world, and their families and doctors and scientists everywhere affected by researching and fighting to find a cure for NPC1. These families, doctors, and scientists will be positively impacted by what you have done here tonight and by the continuing work of the Firefly Fund. Pam and Chris, it's amazing to witness what you have accomplished in less than 12 months. It truly is a testament to what a community, you bet. That what you've done is a, a testament to what a community can accomplish when everyone comes together in the spirit of a willingness of heart and neighbors helping neighbors. I'm looking forward to the, what I'm sure will be the tremendous effect of the Firefly Fund that it will have a, for children suffering from genetic neurodegenerative diseases everywhere. Thank you for your efforts and for having me this evening. Out of adversity can rise great efforts, and tonight, instead of despair and hopelessness, our village is filled with optimism and hope for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Rather, for that uh, and for reminding us what we can do as a community when we come together. Now, I want to welcome Dr. William Schwartz, who is with us tonight and speaking on behalf of State Senator Kirk Watson and Dean Clay Johnston of the University of Texas Del Seton Medical School. Dr. Schwartz is the Associate Chair of Neurology for Research and Education and recently, as in last month, moved to Austin for the position. Senator Watson and the medical school's commitment to creating a world-class medical school with a strong focus on neurosciences is incredibly exciting to the Firefly Fund. I want to welcome Dr. William Schwartz. Thanks very much, Anne. Um, I can't see everybody by the light, but I know you're there. So um, I'm delighted to say just a few words on behalf of the Dell Medical School uh, and also on the behalf of our dean, Dr. Clay Johnston, as Ann mentioned, and our uh, chair of the Department of Neurology, David Paytafar, both of whom are out of town today and very sorry to be missing this event, I assure you. 
So as Ann mentioned, I'm the Associate Chair for Research and Education in the Department of Neurology at Dell. I arrived one month ago, and that's by way of a number of institutions on the west and east coasts. So the University of California, San Francisco on the west, uh, the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, uh, Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, University of Massachusetts Medical School in Massachusetts on the east. And I mention all this because um, I have to tell you that I would not have predicted moving to Austin. <laughs> but um, as you know, and as you've heard, Dell Medical School is uh, special. Actually, um, it's unique. It's a 21st century medical school being built conceptually and physically from the ground up from scratch um, with the hope that it's an engine of innovation, discovery, and service to the people of this region. Uh, and as, as I'll note just a bit later, well beyond the region. So this medical school has the real potential to be like no other. So how could I say no? Now, um, here I, I also must confess, I'm embarrassed to say that neither my wife, who's sitting in the corner there, uh, nor I have previously been to Austin. <laughs> but yeah, they, I said I was embarrassed, yeah. Uh, we knew, we knew it was supposed to be weird. <laughs> so we were ready for the unexpected. So far there are two surprises. Uh, but I'm sure there will be more. Uh, first, we've discovered back-in angled parking. <laughs> and, and I've tried it and succeeded. Uh, once, you know. Second, second and much more important are the people of Austin and Travis County. You know, I've not seen individuals so engaged, energetic, informed, passionate, and inspirational. So you, wait a minute, we <laughs> are amazing, right? And, and, uh, and Pam and Chris and the Firefly Fund are, of course, exemplary. This is community, yes, as Dan mentioned, uh, but it's also what we call citizen science. When citizens identify a problem, a question, a need, and catalyze solutions in concert with professional scientists, clinicians, and engineers. So what Pam and Chris and the Firefly Fund are accomplishing will be in the textbooks of the future. So, I, I am most eager to see the Firefly, the Firefly Fund and Dell Medical School working synergistically, as, as Pam has said, hand in hand, to shine a light on NPC1. And in this regard, what is particularly exciting, as I'm sure many of you know, is the recent remarkable $50 million transformational gift by the Mulva Family Foundation to establish the Mulva Clinic for the Neurosciences at Dell, surely to become a world-class institute for developing pioneering research and innovative clinical approaches for, as Jim and Miriam Mulva have said, the really difficult diseases especially including those involving neurodegeneration. So, I mean, this is truly an extraordinary opportunity in Austin, really, no place else, to be able to work together to discover and implement new ways to help Bell and Abby and other kids like them. So, um, I say to Pam, Chris, Barry, um, thank you for being such spectacular citizen scientists. Um, and, you know, it's great to be in Austin. <laughs> Thank you.
All right, thank you, Dr. Schwartz. It's exciting to hear about the life-changing work that we know you all are doing and will be able to work with the Firefly Fund. Next, we have a very special speaker who understands better than anyone what the Andrews family is going through. In 1994, Cindy Parsigian and her family learned that three of her four children had NPC1. After the diagnosis, Cindy worked tirelessly to found the Era Parsigian Medical Research Foundation in hopes of saving the lives of her children and hundreds of others around the world affected by NPC1. Unfortunately, Cindy's children did not win their battle with NPC1. Cindy is someone, as you can imagine, that Pam and Chris have looked to as a friend and a mentor as they begin to live life with their new reality after Bell and Abby's diagnosis. Through the Parsigian Fund, Cindy continues to contribute in significant and meaningful ways to the NPC1 community, and it is the Andrew's hope that they can work together with the Parsigian Fund and Cindy to continue to expand on the work that began over 22 years ago. Please join me in welcoming Cindy Parsigian. Good evening. You know, if, if, if somebody told me 25 years ago I was going to father, follow Dan Rather, I would have said, you're crazy. I mean, we, I think we, many of us grew up listening to him in our living rooms every night, um, and it is a privilege um, to follow you. So thank you for coming, Dan. Um, and if I'd been here 25 years ago, I would have told you that I was absolutely the luckiest woman alive. I had married my sweetheart from Notre Dame, we had moved to Tucson, we started a family, and we had four beautiful children. Era, named after his grandfather, Michael, Marcia, and Krista. And our goal was the goal of all parents, and that was to raise healthy, loving, giving, contributing children. And then our son Michael, when he got to be about five years old, he just started showing some developmental delays couldn't quite keep up with the other kids on the playground. His speech had become a little slurred. His handwriting was scratchy. And we just knew something was wrong. So we started taking him around to doctors. First doctor kind of laughed at me and said, you know what, he's a little clumsy, but if he was my child, I wouldn't do anything. But my husband and I, and my husband's a doctor, said that's not right. We'd seen our older son go through a normal development. So we kept knocking on other doors, on other medical doors, and finally, after about two years, our son Michael was diagnosed with Neiman Pick Type C. And because it's a hereditary disease, we had our other three children tested, and much to our disbelief, our two youngest, our two girls, were also tested positive. We cried, we screamed, we yelled. And I'm not embarrassed to say that I curse God. But after about three weeks, and I, I know that Pam and Chris went through the same thing, you sit back and you go, what am I going to do to impact my children? And at that time, there was virtually nothing going on with Neiman Pick Type C. And you might say, well, what is Neiman Pick Type C? And you saw a little bit in the video. Neiman Pick Type C disease is a cholesterol and other lipid storage disease where children cannot process cholesterol correctly and it gets trapped in every cell in their body and you start seeing it, the neurological degeneration when the cholesterol builds up in the neurons. And that's where the real problems start developing. Children lose their ability to walk, to talk. Seizures are common, and most children do not make it to adulthood. At the time our children were diagnosed, there was very little known about the disease. And that's when we started talking about setting up a research fund. Because we knew that was the only chance we had to impact our children's life. One of the first things we did, which we thought was critical, is we set up a scientific advisory board. Because we knew that even though my, doc my husband was a doctor, that we did not have the skills necessary to move that research forward. And we were blessed with a group of researchers that said, we want to help. They're all volunteer. We want to help direct that science. And that's what's made the science really move forward over the last 20 years. A lot of people will say, you know, and then, then after we did that, we um, asked my father-in-law, if he would help us, and he jumped in with both feet. And thank God that era 
has such a wonderful reputation. He is known as an honorable man and somebody that you could trust. And he gave us that national exposure that was so critical to getting the foundation underway. People will say, well, why should we study rare diseases? And I'm going to give you a couple examples. First, there's um, some of you doctors in town here might know of the names of Dr. Brown and Goldstein. They're at UT Southwestern. And back in the 60s and early 70s, they were um, researching a disease where children were having cholesterol levels in the thousands and having heart attacks at five and six years old. So Dr. Brown and Dr. Goldstein started researching this, and they found out that there was a way that we metabolized our cholesterol and that these children um, were having this cholesterol buildup in that route. Their work led to statins. And I don't know about you, but I'm on a statin, and I think it's one of the most prescribed drugs in the United States. Their work on a rare disease led to statin and earned them a Nobel Prize. Since we came along and isolated our gene that's responsible for Neiman Pick, they have now turned their lab into focusing on Neiman Pick research. I'll give you another example. Is that amazing? I'll give you another example. You know, Ebola has been in the press for the last couple of years because it's been so devastating around the world. The Ebola virus relies on a functioning NPC gene, or the virus cannot get into cells. So a mouse that doesn't have a well-functioning NPC gene is immune to Ebola. It is thought that carriers and children with Neiman Pick cannot get Ebola because the, the Virus cannot get into the cells. So there's a tremendous amount of research going on now because of Ebola and its con connection to NPC. We've had um, great success in the last 23 years. We've raised over $45 million. We have a, the very first conference we had 22 years ago. We had two researchers show up for it. And we sat around and go, OK, where do we go from here? This last year, where I first met Chris and Pam, we had over 100 researchers. And the enthusiasm and the dedication of these researchers is just phenomenal and really gives you a sense of hope that a difference is going to be made in this disease. There are basically five drugs right now that are in trials. One that has been approved in 30 countries and shows to reduce and slow down the disease process in some children. The drug that was discussed in the video it was our funded researchers that first identified and developed that drug. We passed it on to the NIH, and the NIH now passed it on to VTES, who's now in a phase two, three trial, and is showing great promise in slowing down the disease. And then we have several other drugs that are actually in the pipeline, and we're looking at some combinational therapies at this time. But along with that, that great success we've had, we've also had tremendous sorrow. Michael, our cowboy, had a seizure early one morning in his bed and died at the age of 10. And then Krista, our youngest of the three, who loved the color purple, the color of hope, died of pneumonia when she was 10 and a half. And then Marcia, our wheelchair-bound ballerina who just loved to dance, succumbed to pneumonia at 16 and a half. Mother Teresa once said that you will be judged not by what you do here on earth, but on the amount of love you leave behind. And Michael, Marcia, and Krista, they left a legacy of love. They had a smile for everyone. They gave us joy through their laughter. They gave us strength through their hugs. And they gave us courage through their acceptance. And they showed us how precious life is. Cahill Gorban once said that when either joy or sorrow becomes great, the world becomes small. And I have to tell you, that has been what has happened to our family. We have been wrapped in love and in support since the moment our children were diagnosed. And I'm sure that there are other parents whose children are terminally ill will tell you the exact same thing. And I know that Chris and Pam are feeling that love from you here tonight, that you've come to help, that you're making the world small for them. You know, and there are several other NPC family members here tonight. I know I saw Jonathan Jacoby, and I saw Jean Quant, and I'm sorry if I, I didn't see everyone in the, in the audience, but thank you for coming. I really do appreciate it, and I know the family does too. I have a real 
belief that with Pam and Chris and the entire Andrews family, that joining together, we're going to make this disease go away. We're going to make leaps and bounds in the research, and it's going to continue the momentum, and it's going to get us across that goal line. You know, there's some researchers here, too. I, I know that Liz Kravitz is here, and let's see who else. Ben's over there. Um, I think I saw Dan Ori. I know I saw Dan Ori and Charles Veet and Kristen Davis is someplace, and I don't know if I missed anybody else, but those are the rock stars. They're the ones who do, are doing it. And, and I think it shows how committed they are that they would come across country to show their support and help kill, kick this fund off. You are a blessing, each and every one of you. Your blessing to the families, your blessing to the kids, your blessing to the community. I think the NPC families, Jonathan, the Quants, the Andrews, the Parsegians, I think we're a prime example that God not, might not answer our prayers the way we'd like, and instead what he does is he brings people into our lives to hold us up along the way. And I have a cross collection. And I never intended to have a cross collection, but I want to share the history of it with you. It was about 23 years ago. 23, 20 years, let me think about this. 20 years ago, 20 years ago right now. It was Lent, and my daughter Krista, who was about the three and a half at the time, she made a little cross in preschool out of two little twigs, and it was wrapped with plastic flowers. My oldest son, Era, made a cross out of palms from Palm Sunday and gave it to me. And then the week later, I was handed the cross under, from my son Michael's grave. And that started this cross collection. And it has grown over the years. And I've been giving crosses from family, from friends, from researchers. I know one researcher knew that I had a collection, and he pulled one out of his pocket that he'd been holding in his pocket for years. There was an NPC child that made me one. And I keep this cross collection as a reminder that we all have crosses to bear. And they're all different. And it's amazing to me that you can take a, a form as simple as a cross and artistically render it so differently. So it's a reminder we all have our crosses. But it's also a reminder that the only way we get through life is by helping each other carry our crosses. We are absolutely in this life together. My prayers have morphed over the years. When the kids were first diagnosed, my prayer was cure my children. And then it was don't let my children suffer. From there, transform to love my children. And then to bring my family peace. Now to the last prayer, I have added the following which a dear, dear friend taught me. And his Lord, lead me to the, today to those I need and to the ones who need me, and let something I do have everlasting significance. And that's what has been demonstrated to me over and over again. God has brought people into my life to help me along the way. And he will give me the opportunity to help others if I just take the moment to look. And if I have the chance, I can add something to his great creation. You here tonight have shown that you want to make a difference. And so, lead us today to those we need and to the ones who need us. And let something we do together have eternal significance. Thank you. Th thank you so much, Cindy, for sharing your powerful story. You truly are an inspiration. I now have the honor to introduce and welcome up to the stage Pam and Chris Andrews. The Firefly Fund would not be possible without their vision, dedication, love, and strength. Almost a year ago, they received devastating news. They channeled 
that devastating news into action. And today, with the launch of the Firefly Fund, have absolutely every reason to be hopeful. It's easy to say that they have been an inspiration to all of us. So give Pam and Chris Andrews a warm welcome. In the past 50 weeks, there have been people who have said to us, you and Pam are so brave, and we appreciate the compliment. But to be honest, it's easy to be brave. Why? Because we can cure this disease. We believe we can cure this disease because we've been standing on the shoulders of giants. People like Cindy and Michael Parsigian started fighting against this disease when there was literally no hope. People like our fellow MPC1 parents, a community that has rallied behind us. Within hours of diagnosis, we received countless phone calls from MPC1 parents. Some flew across the country just to say, it's gonna be okay. Some of them are here tonight. Institutions like the NIH and people like Dr. Denny Porter, who in the course of his career has literally met most of the children that have been diagnosed with MPC-1 in this country. Countless times, he's had to look into a mother's eyes and say, I'm sorry, there is no cure. And sadly, he has watched many children die. But he keeps fighting every day, again and again. There are people like Dr. Elizabeth Barry Kravis who became involved in this fight simply because a desperate family knocked on our front door and said, please, will you help us? She couldn't say no. She still can't say no. And she didn't say no to us. There's institutes like Seton Healthcare Family and Dell Children Medical Center who are living up to their motto of treating the most vulnerable. Dr. James Gibson and Dr. Gus Park, who under no obligation have gotten involved in a complex clinical trial simply because they saw an opportunity to help these kids. Vitesse, when most people hear of a horrible disease, they just assume there's some company out there working on it. And that's not always the case. And especially not the case in rare disease. Ben, the CEO of Vitesse, came out of a comfortable retirement to join this fight because he felt like he could save some lives. He felt like he could make a difference. Our friends who have stood by our side from that first dark day, they came running to help us and they never left. Many have put their own lives on hold to save ours. They dropped everything to go to Chicago with us, to hold the girls' hands, to be there, to let, to let us know that we're not alone. Eric Taylor, Sandra Schell, Catherine Oliver, AKA Bronco, there's a story behind that. <laughs> too, many, too many people to name. Our family, our brothers and sisters who have given us unending love and support. Pam's sister, Lisa, has transversed this country a half dozen times in the last 50 weeks to help us understand and fight this disease. Pam's sister, Jessica, who spearhead multiple fundraisers, has taken the girls to Chicago many times and has been integral in getting the fire fund, fund off the ground. My mother, Betty Andrews, who is and always will be my rock. And Barry Crowley, my mother-in-law, who is undoubtedly the strongest, fiercest, most determined woman in this room. There are too many people to mention and not enough time, but they are all heroes, all of them, all of you. So why are we so brave? It's easy when you're surrounded by heroes. We can cure this disease. 
we will cure this disease. This is what we believe. This is what we all believe. This is what Firefly believes and this is what it stands for. This is our tribe. This is our village. We can't do it alone. We need each of you, each and every one of you. We need your friends, their friends, and their friends. But to be clear, this is not a plea for sympathy. This is a call for action. The cure for this disease is in when arms reach. These children, not just our Bell and Abby, but children all over the world are counting on us and counting on you. We must cure this disease. There's no other acceptable outcome. It is our honor, it is our pleasure, our privilege to invite you to join our village, this tribe of believers. Thank you. There are some donation cards um, with uh, some of our team members scattered throughout the room. Um, they're holding them up, so please, if you haven't already contributed to the Firefly Fund, um, consider making a do donation tonight, or you can take a contribution card home. Um, we're going to show one more video from our friend and fellow Austinite um, and fellow Longhorn, fellow Texan, Matthew McConaughey, a new member to the Firefly Fund Village. So we're happy to show you, uh, this with, share this with you all tonight, and uh, thank you again from the bottom of our hearts to all of you for, for being here. It means um, everything to us. Hey everybody, thank you for being here tonight to celebrate the launch of the Firefly Fund. This fund is going to support the research and the education necessary to accelerate a cure for a rare progressive disease called NPC1. Um, while I'm proud to be here as a Texan, while I'm proud to be an Austinite and as well be a Longhorn, myself, like many of you, are, are most proud to, to, to be a parent. Um, you know, I, I know firsthand. Um, the lengths parents will go to help their children, especially when they're sick. Um, I want to say to Pam and Chris, I support your valiant efforts to creating the Firefly Fund. It's a wonderful way to honor your daughters and to support the race for a cure for this tragic disease. I hope that all of you out there will join me in supporting the Andrews family uh, and the many other children that have this horrific disease. Uh, thank you for joining the village. You know, um, in addition to donating to the Firefly Fund, there's many other ways to help. And if you want to find out what those are, go to the website firefly.fund and they'll let you know how. Um, thanks for your time. Thanks for being here. In the meantime, and all times, just keep living. Thank you again to everyone for being here tonight. That concludes our program, so fill your glasses. Be sure to find that donation card, and in just a few minutes, we've got some live music for you. Thank you again for being here.